let's be real. Lawsuits are no fun, but with Paulson and Nace, at least they are a little easier. With two DC-born partners, Paulson and Nace will fight for you the way only a Washingtonian could. Paulson and Nace handles medical malpractice, wrongful death, and other complex injury cases involving negligence. So if you have been hurt or lost a loved one because of someone else's mistake or negligence, call Paulson and Nace for a no-obligation consultation. Visit www.paulsonandnace.com or call 202-463-1999. Today on CityCast DC, the city sends a warning to unlicensed weed shops in the city, an update on keeping sports teams in DC, and one-star reviews of Capital One Arena. To get into all of this, I'm joined by producers Ash Durbin and Julia Karen. Today's Tuesday, April 9th. I'm Bridget Todd, and here's what DC is talking about. Ash, I feel like this is a topic that has come up on the show before, but what is going on with DC and these unlicensed weed gifting shops? Yeah, so there's actually quite a bit of updates. It is seemingly the end of an era as far as the weird gray market, I-71, Initiative 71 uh, gifting market. If people don't know what that is, we've talked about it a lot before. Um We have the DC Parents versus Dispensaries episode, which really goes in deep. We will drop that in the show notes. But essentially, it's like a loophole that allows weed stores to, you know, give you a tote bag for $50. And surprise, surprise, in that tote bag is a bunch of weed products. That's right, because you can't just buy weed outright like a normal human. You actually have to, like, do a circuitous, like, here's a thing. And like, oh, look, weed, right? (laughs) Gone. Exactly. Exactly. It's 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 all messed up, but that is seemingly all coming to an end now. In what way? So like I go into a shop and I just buy weed or so they want to move everybody to the medical realm. So in November essentially, they gave all the gray markets 90 days to apply to transition to a legal market and so they had 90 days to apply. Only 80 shops applied. (laughs) Oh, my God. That's so few. At this point, just hundreds of shops that are just kind of like doing this weird pirate underground selling. I mean, which is like, I guess, kind of what they've been doing. But now DC is going to start clamping down on it. So they administered the first 13 warnings. And they'll give out these warnings and then it's going to be fines and then it's going to be cease and desist. So if they don't start moving along the process to become medical, I guess we could see a lot of marijuana shops closing. I don't I mean, we'll, we'll see what happens. I'm sure in the fullness of time, this is something that will feel impactful for folks who are looking to buy weed in D.C. But right now, 13 gifting shops in D.C., there are like two alone on my block. That seems like right. such a oh, small amount I know. when you consider how many are actually in the city. It almost feels like the type of thing where it's like in like middle school when you're like, if we all skip class, then <laughs> they can't give us <laughs> all the attention. <laughs> exactly. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's very we- like I I think part of the incentive to apply to become medical is obviously like you won't get shut down. All the businesses that applied to become medical in the 90 day period uh, kind of have this immunity, I guess, where they're saying like, you know, MPD or uh, ABCA or whoever, like, won't come after you if at least you're in the process of becoming, uh, you know, licensed medical shop. But even amongst that, uh, there was a shop who was in the process of becoming uh, licensed medical and they got raided in March and six, six employees were arrested. Oh, my God. This whole thing just feels like just messy. It's all in the weeds. No pun intended. (laughs) It's just I feel like we've kind of shot ourselves in the foot slash the federal situation makes it weird. And it's just like it's this big tangle that's very hard to untangle, it seems like at this point. So when you consider the current existing kind of gray area loophole marketplace, 
Within that marketplace, are there rules and restrictions about how these businesses can operate in the city? Well, one of the big ones that has also come up this week is about how close you can be to schools, Mm. which, like we said, we did an episode on DC parents versus weed dispensaries, which goes super in depth into it. But it came back up because there was a bill that council voted on that would have prohibited cannabis stores close to schools. So essentially, the the long and short of it is you're not allowed to have a weed shop within a 300 foot radius of a school unless it's in a consumer zone. So unless it's like it's a place where there's a lot of businesses and stuff, there was a bill to make that loophole go away. So you wouldn't be able to be close to schools, uh, regardless of the zone you were. It was a tough vote in council. It was 6-6 with one absence and it didn't go through. There's been countless parents raising a fuss about weed shops too close to daycares and schools and all this stuff for for a while. So honestly, I'm a little bit surprised that that didn't go through. In the future, like if I or someone I know like wants to go buy weed at a weed shop, is there like a license that ABCA places on like the storefront where it's like this is a licensed medical marijuana shop and you don't have to do the the gifting thing where you get the tote bag with the weed in it? Like what's the future of this? Yeah, there was actually the first protest hearing ever between a medical cannabis business and parents. And it was actually pretty enlightening to read the details because um, a lot of parents' concerns are about risk of a cash business. I think it's a big concern Mm. because a lot of the gifting shops, you know, it's cash only. And that makes you a target for robbery, which is scary. And you definitely don't want your kids near that. But another big thing they said was they didn't like the idea of their kids passing weed advertisement all the time. And so the spokesman for ABCA kind of shot that down and said that the I-71 gray market shops are the only ones that can advertise like that for whatever reason. And the medical cannabis shops have way more rules about advertising. And they're kind of like, you might not even be able to tell that it's a weed business when you walk by. So I think the idea of, you know, making it medical is hopefully just like a safer and better way to buy weed. Julia, this is a story that I feel like we cannot keep out of our mouths. I know. It comes up all the time on the show. We have talked about it. I feel like every day there's like a new wrinkle or a new update. What is going on with the sports teams in D.C.? So last week, council unanimously passed Mayor Bowser's $515 million deal uh, with Monumental Sports and Entertainment founder Ted Leontis. So this is a deal that would keep the Wizards and Capitals in D.C. through, get this date, 2050. Crazy. <laughs> 2050. That is That feels like so far away. Yeah. Are we ever are we even going to get there? I don't know. I I don't know. Cannot stress this enough. The terms of this deal are not final. DC's got 70 days to negotiate the terms of the Monumental per the mayor's office. And basically, something that has come up is there's this tax provision. And I know that like when we start talking about taxes, people are like, oh my God, you're making me eat my vegetables. Yes, I'm, I'm promising you this is vegetables. We will add like soy sauce or mayo or something on it to make it a little more palatable. But here we go. This tax provision is going to basically benefit Monumental if, like, say, the city were to impose a new tax that would help fund, I don't know, the new Commander's football stadium at RFK. Right. So they basically get this loophole. Monumental is going to determine within 30 days uh, if this is economically and operationally viable, particularly building a new Wizards practice facility at Gallery Place Center. Basically, if that doesn't materialize, DC is going to identify another city-owned location. Uh, possibly the RFK stadium site. So like RFK for everything that we're talking about, uh, Capital One Arena is getting mentioned a lot here. It's sure. wild. Yeah. This kind of brings up for me like, and I don't know if you guys feel this way too, but like obviously so happy to have the teams still in DC. And there's been a lot of talk like, oh, like Bowser, the council did a great job to keep him, whatever. It's like looking at some of these terms, it's like kind of feels like Ted walked all over them a little bit. Like, it says he has a monumental sports ambassador mm. 
to Mm -hmm. ensure seamless project approvals, reviews, issue resolutions, and other assistance. That's a hired city employee to pretty much make sure like everything goes through. (laughs) I don't know. (laughs) Like that, it feels like a little bit like, like I'm happy they're here. Like I said, but like, are we just giving everything? Like, is this just going to be like Ted world? You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I think the short answer is that one of Bowser's big challenges, right, is keeping downtown viable. You know, people aren't going into offices and we need a way for people to come downtown. And it feels like this is an integral part of that is like, well, if the Caps and the Wizards are here and Monumental owns this building, our goal should be to shunt as many people as humanly possible into this area so it becomes economically viable for downtown, right? So like part of that is like, well, supposedly Monumental has like labor provisions for all this, right? There are several sections basically saying Monumental agrees to use its best efforts to hire something like 51% of its construction workers as DC residents and maybe fulfill like at least 50% of construction contracts from local certified companies. So it's clear like Bowser's goal in this is to make downtown more viable, a place where people want to be, get that tax revenue right back up so we can balance the city's budget. Um, which, as Alex Coma explained on our roundup on Friday, like there's a lot of cuts. And in order to fund some of the stuff, it's got to come from somewhere. And a lot of that is going to be making downtown a viable place for people to be and taxing goods and services. And so, yes, like I think Ted is kind of walking all over us a little bit. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to deny that. But I think if that's an integral part of the plan to make downtown viable, you got to have concessions somewhere. And I feel like, yes, this is full of concessions, but. I think it's the price that they're paying to keep the teams here and make DC economically viable downtown, at least. And I got into a lot of this in a conversation I had with Candace Buckner from the Washington Post about Ted Leonsis' legacy in DC and sort of how it connects to how folks are feeling about downtown in general and sort of what can be done to make that feel like a place that people really feel good about spending time. And so I think it just goes to show how many different intersecting interests this one story has with the city. It's a real estate story, a sports story, a tax story, a crime story, a culture story, a race story. There's so many different intersections here. I feel like the way that they described it was like as a relationship, right? Where like you kind of go and see other people, right? You date around and then you come back. Uh, my parents' big line on this is marriage is one big compromise. And in this instance, I feel like this is kind of a compromise, right? Like Ted supposedly was going to get, you know, all these bells and whistles out in Northern Virginia. And then he got stymied, right? He can't build, you know, this super area that he necessarily wants to, but He's also keeping the teams downtown and that does something for his goodwill, right? So again, it's, I don't know how compromisey this is going to be. It does feel a little bit like we're getting walked all over. Uh, And obviously that money has to come from somewhere and it's probably going to be our tax dollars at work. Uh, But that said, like, yes, I'm happy the teams are downtown. But again, this is a first vote of this. They're going to hash it out further. Obviously we will keep you all updated. But again, something to keep an eye on is, Will we continue to have this or what other amendments to this are going to come up? What's going to change? That will be interesting to see. And I, I think a through line in like watching the vote where it went through, where like council members were all talking about it. It was very much a generalized, like everybody being like, this is great, yes. but we have to like hold Ted and the situation accountable so that it's like actually good for D.C. and Washingtonians. So hopefully that happens. Yeah, I mean, time will tell to see if it's good for Washingtonians. Hopefully the the Wizards and the Caps are equally good. So it's, you know, our tax dollars went towards a thing that was actually entertaining. But, you know, again, <laughs> we, we will see. So speaking of D.C. sports teams... Let's take a look at some of the less than stellar reviews of Capital One Arena. Oh, boy. I need to give a pretty big caveat here. I've been sort of on the one-star review beat on the podcast because I love a good, bad review. Like, if if somebody has written a detailed, bad review, I want to read it. Usually, I'm pulling the funny ones about different monuments in D.C. I want to give a big caveat that, surprisingly... This It was actually not easy to find good, substantive, funny reviews. If you go on Google Reviews and sort 
the reviews of the Capital One Arena by lowest. A lot of those reviews are very long. They're very detailed. And they oh actually do sound. I was like, oh, wow, these people like, this sounds like a legitimate <laughs> grievance. <laughs> they did their research. Yeah. It's a lot of like very well written, very well researched, Dang. legitimate grievances. So I did want to make that clear, but I did find some good ones. So let's get into it. Let's go. Lay them on me. So another kind of flavor of a bad review that I like is when the review has nothing to do with like the venue. So this, this person said, went to a comedy show there and it was a waste. Wasn't funny at all. So that's not really a review of Capital One Arena. It's really a review of whatever comedian you saw and did not enjoy. It depends on the, the act, right? Like, who was the act? Yeah, this person went to see Carrot Top and was like, God damn it, Ted Leonsis. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. Another blunder for the mayor. Yeah. <laughs> who are you seeing at Capital One Arena where, like, obviously, like, you're going to, like, some shows are going to be hit or miss, you know? Like, you are going to go to shows, I feel like. Any sporting event, any show, sometimes not going to be good. I can tell you, I went to a Nats game recently and oof it was horrendous. Uh, not because the concessions were bad, but because the Nats were bad, right? So, yeah, I don't know. I feel like spending money on a thing, it's its kind of like you get what you get, but uh, I'm sorry to this person. It's kind of like going to a restaurant and like eating your full meal and then being like, can I have my money back? That kind of like, Can I send it back? Sucks. <laughs> like, it's like you ate it, bro. What are you talking? Also, with a comedy show, don't you know what you're getting into? Yes. Kind of like, I mean, it's one thing if you're going to like a small comedy club and seeing like, small comics or whatever but like you're going to what i have to imagine is one of the world's biggest comedians for them to be at capital one arena and you get there and you're yes. like, who's this guy dude this guy I know, sucks right? like, like, what did you, <laughs> you bought the ticket dude what this is mean? why you watch the netflix special before to judge accordingly right and see yeah. if they're in your lane and then you fork over the money to go exactly. to the arena you know all right anything else we should know bridget julia this is really a question for you as somebody who goes to hockey games at oh, the God. capital one arena a lot Okay. There was a lot of unsportsmanlike fan behavior talked about in the reviews. This person <laughs> says that it started off great until someone told me there was more bathrooms, quote, on the fifth floor, and I could go there to avoid a long line. As a visiting opponent fan, I was shocked by the poor sportsmanship of the Ca Washington Capitals fans. It was not <laughs> a great experience. Do you know anything about this? Like, is that like a scam where they like trick on a like the fan oh. of the of the visiting team into going someplace where there's not a bathroom that's a wild chirp i've never heard that before i will say as someone who has sat in the 400s in the nosebleeds like the cl the closer to the ceiling the closer to god right i mean <laughs> it is you you are up there and you kind of fear for your life uh which i guess means the bathroom is like less accessible that's not a chirp i've ever heard at the at cap one it's wild but i know like it's not like soccer where there's hooliganism but like people can get like rowdy like our big rivalry if you're a capitals fan is with the pittsburgh penguins and there's this tradition where you take over the steps of the national portrait gallery like next door post game there were a lot of uh, one star reviews that said go pens so one mm. review said get rid that of that right. ugly face on the capitals banner go pens <laughs> exclamation point so this is like this is just a little bit of like sports hating this isn't even really a review the results are skewed. Yeah, I know. What I'm, what I'm hearing is is Penn's fans don't like Capital One Arena. Uh, and if that's the case, uh, go to PPG Paints in Pittsburgh. Yeah. Sorry to CityCast Pittsburgh for this. We love you. <laughs> no, we're going to have a rivalry with them now, Julia. We're going to be reading one-star reviews of our own podcast left from CityCast Pittsburgh fans. I dare them. I will leave you with my favorite one-star review of Capital One Arena. Closing alcohol sales during Elton John before the scheduled break is criminal to those of us dragged here by our wives. Listen. Oh, wow. <laughs> that is criminal. That is criminal. I understand it. Listen. In that instance, and I have done this with my brother and my friends, the trick is you got to buy all the booze beforehand. You got to stop at like multiple vendors, right? Drop your beers off at your place because there's like a two beer limit or something like that. You got to rotate. You got to be smart. You got to stock up. This person sounds allergic to fun, like dragged by your wife. You don't like Elton John? Dude? Seriously. Like, what, what, what? That's like a weird macho take that I've never heard. But come on, guys. You're telling me you you listen to Tiny Dancer only five beers deep? Come on, man. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> come on. Well, Ash, Juliet, thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Bridget. Thanks, Bridget. That 
that's all for today here on CityCast DC. Our interim executive producers are Julia Karen and Kayla Cody Stemmerman. Kayla also writes our super informative and fun newsletter, Hey DC. Our interim producer is Ash Durbin, and our hosts are Michael Schaefer and me, Bridget Todd. Music is by Alex Roldan. If you enjoyed the show, why not tell a friend, rate the show, leave us a review, and subscribe to our morning newsletter. We'll be back tomorrow morning with even more news from around the city. Talk to you then.